In this video, let's talk about a few different ways to get an estimate of your VO2 max. We'll talk about when it might make sense to use your Garmin or Coros watch and use the estimate on that, and we'll talk about when it might make sense just to ignore that number. We'll dive into a few different ways that you can run a field test of your own to get a better estimate of your own VO2 max. The VO2 max, or the closely associated VDOT, are widely used in running circles. They get used for the basis of many training programs and just a general guideline for your fitness and any sort of pacing strategies you might have for pretty much all racing distances. It is the most widely used metric of your general fitness when it comes to running. It's becoming more and more common for GPS running watches to have a built-in VO2 max estimating function. And those can be really handy and really useful if you really understand what you're looking at and how those calculations are made. Sometimes it makes sense just to ignore it, really depending on your personal situation. So let's take a quick look at when it might make sense to look at that number and when it makes sense just to ignore it. So the, the GPS watch, it can do a really good job of estimating your VO2 max if it's given the right conditions. So basically those conditions are just that the watch itself can, can see you working out really hard in pretty standardized conditions. Um, so where it doesn't work is maybe the easier way to think about it is when it's put in an environment where it, it can't see you working hard either because you're inside on the treadmill or on the, on the indoor track um, or if you're running in conditions that are, are pretty suboptimal. So if you're, if you're working really hard because you're running at altitude or you're running in the heat or you're running in some really technical trails or even this morning, like I was running on the road, but it was there was a lot of ice, so I was I was running pretty slow, um, and, and you know running a little bit easier. But the, the watch is not going to get a chance to really do a, a good job of assessing your VO two max um, if if you're not working hard. Um, so you know, but by that same measure, if you don't ever run hard with your watch, um, you know that that could get, be the same issue. So if if you typically just do easy runs. Uh, then the watch is probably not going to do a great job of assessing your your VO2 max. Um, you know, re remember, VO2 max is your, your body's ability to process the most amount of oxygen it possibly can. And if you're just going for a jog and you're not, not actually testing your body's ability to, you know, to push it to the limits, then, um, you know, it, it's not going to be able to do a proper assessment. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, that just means that, you know, most of these VO2 max type tests and to, and to get a proper assessment of your VO2 max, it's going to require you to, to be working really hard. Like you're going to need to be, you know, really sucking wind. And that's, um, you know, that's probably a good indicator of, of, of whether or not, um, you know, you're getting a good indication of, of your true, true maximum is you need to be working really hard. If, um, if you never sort of put yourself out there and you never give your, your body a chance to, you know, to, to work really hard, then there really isn't going to be a test that's going to be able to, to, to properly assess that with, with a high, high degree of accuracy. So if you're not going to rely on the watch alone, and, and I don't think you should just rely on the watch alone, then, um, then let's talk about some of the other field tests that you can do to, to, to either help validate what the watch is saying or to, to get a more accurate reading. Um, and some of these could actually help help the watch do that assessment. If you um, you know if you do one of these field tests on the track or do it outside, then you know you might find that your um, you know that your watch reading will will improve as well. Um, I actually had that happen this um, you know this this past um, couple couple of weeks where I had been doing a lot of marathon training. Like I mentioned, most of that gets done inside, um, but when when um, when that came to a stop and I started doing some 5k training, um, all of a sudden, um, I had a chance to do some, some, some races and some workouts out, outside. And, and I don't think my fitness improved that much, but all of a sudden my VO2 max, um, indication on my watch spiked up by, by, by several points. Um, you know, mostly from the couple of races that I ran and a, and a few of the workouts that I was doing outside. So, you know, just, just giving the watch a chance to see you're working really hard outside, um, just gives it the ability to to do its calculations properly, um, and so some of these field tests that um, that I'll describe, you know, not only will they 
give you a, a firsthand assessment of your VO2 max, it could also probably benefit um, your watch's ability to, to, to make those calculations as well. So maybe the simplest way to get an estimate of your VO2 max is just to go run a 5K. You know, you take your time from your 5K and you take it over to, um, to a VDOT or VO2 max table, um, find your time on the, for the 5K, and then it translates over to your VDOT or VO2 max, and you know, pretty easy way to do it. Um, obviously the downside is, is that you need to, um, you know, you need to go run the 5K. If it's in the middle of the winter time and you can't find one, then it might be difficult. Um, but you also might be in the situation where, you know, you're, you're looking to go run a 5K and you really have no idea how to pace yourself and you really have no idea how to, to go about training and doing interval workouts for that 5K. And so you're looking for a way to, to you know, to gauge your, you know, your fitness, um, you know, in, in preparation for that 5K. So I'm not saying that that is the approach for, for everybody, but if you're a, um, if you're a relatively seasoned runner and, and you enjoy, go, you know, going and, um, and running a 5K, it's a good way to get a, a bit more racing experience. And you can really check the box on, on getting a solid estimate on, um, you know, on your, on your VO2 max. So if you decide you don't want to do a 5K or you can't get a 5K, probably the, you know, the closest thing to that would just be to do a time trial. Uh, personally, I think doing a 5K time trial is, is a, little bit, um, a little bit too much. Um, most, most experts think that you know, somewhere in the 10 minute range is, is the best way, 10 to 12 minute range is the best way to, uh, to, to estimate your VO2 max. And so what's your, what's your maximum effort for that time frame? Um, which makes the, you know, the 5K a little bit too long. Um, the only reason I you know, recommend the 5K is because it seems to be that that's a very popular race distance and it's easy to find one of those. Um, but if you're not going to go that route, then I probably would recommend doing something like a 3K or a two mile. Um, you could do that on the track. You could do it on, on the treadmill. Um, if, if you do do it on the treadmill, I would recommend that you, you know, set the incline at, at 1% just to, to offset the, um, any sort of wind resistance that seems to be a little bit more, more normalized than, than just running it flat. Um, but that's, but that's sort of a good alternative way to running the 5k. Now, I think that's probably one of the simple ways, but it doesn't mean that it's, um, that it's easy. I think that's, it's very difficult to, to, to you know, to run a, a two mile time trial. And I, I get a little bit nervous just even thinking about it. Um, uh, I think running a, running a two mile all out, um, is, is, is very difficult and very, very, very painful. Um, but but, you know, again, you don't need to go all out. If you leave a little bit, um, you know, a little bit within you, then then I think that's fine. Um, you might be off by, you know, a, a point or so, or maybe you're underestimated by a point. But in the grand scheme of things, that's probably not a big a big deal. So if you're a more experienced runner and you can't get into a 5K, uh, that's that's probably the the route that, that I would go. Do like probably a, a two-mile time trial, same thing, and then just take take the time from the two-mile time trial translated over in your in your VO, VO2 max calculator online there's you know there's hundreds of those online or this is from the from the Jack Daniels book there's there's a nice table in there that um you know it's very well dog eared in my book I use it all the time um you know that's that's probably what I would recommend for 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 more seasoned runners um you know p pacing that can be difficult for for a new runner and so um, a little bit easier to pace than than running a full 5k but if you're sort of new new to the game or you don't really know where your level of fitness is at all, then then I probably would recommend one of the you know one of the other field tests. So an alternative to doing a time trial is to do what's called the Cooper 12 minute test, kind of similar to a time trial, but instead of going for a set distance, you're doing a set time. In this case, it's 12 minutes. Um, you're kind of going to kind of treat it like you would a time trial or a race. You're still going to do a nice warm up, stretch out, and do everything you usually would before a, a competition. And basically, you're just going to run as far as you possibly can in that in that 12 minute span. Um, take that take that distance, whether it from is from the you know the treadmill or from the track, and um, and you plug it into into that calculation, and it gives you an estimate of your of your VO2 max. You know, if, if you do decide to do it on the treadmill. Again, I would um, you know set it at a one one percent grade just to like I said compensate for the wind. Um, you know a few a few caveats with with doing the Cooper test is that it is meant for um, maybe you're like your average runner. If you if you sort of fall on either of the extremes, then it might not work work as well. Um, 
So anyways, it's, I think it would be a good test for someone who doesn't want to do a time trial um, and is, you know, not basically not if you're not an elite athlete, um, then, then I probably think it would, it would, would work for you okay. So if the idea of doing a 10 to 20 minute time trial or race um, isn't appealing to you and you're looking for maybe an alternative way to do it, um, the other way you could handle a VO2 max test is what's called a, a treadmill ramp test. And this basically takes a combination of your of the, of the, the elevation or the incline that you're running and then the speed um, when, you, when you max out. And those get plugged into a formula to determine what your VO2 max is. Um, uh, kind of like like the Cooper test, these um, can have a tendency to to overestimate your your VO2 max um, if if you're um, you know a, a pretty seasoned or an elite athlete. Um, in which case, I would probably just recommend doing the, the you know the, the time trial. Um, but if you're not an elite athlete, then I think this is probably a, a good protocol to use, um, especially if you're intimidated by the, the you know the, the time trial aspect of it. Um, but, you know, there's there's several different protocols. Um, all of these protocols feed into the, the ACSM um, or American College of Sports Medicine equation, uh, which, like I said, com combines your combines the, the grade and the, the speed at which you're running when you max out to to determine your VO2 max. Um, you know, the, the protocol that I would recommend uh, would be, again, to do a do, do a nice warm up, you know, at least a 10 minute warm up, take a little break and, and sort of get stretched out and um, and get just get yourself all ready, um, and then get on get on the treadmill. Um, I probably would recommend doing it at a at a two percent grade. Um, you, you can do it. Um, there's a few different options that w which grade you can do it at. Um, I like a slightly higher grade. I find that um, you know that that people will um, you know it, it makes the test go faster essentially. Essentially, and I think that's what a lot of people want is to um, you know to be to be put out of their misery kind of you know so sooner than later. Uh, so I like doing it at a two two percent grade. You, you could go higher, and, I, and I'll give you the equations to you know to do that. Um, and then essentially start at a a comfortable pace. And so that's obviously just a, a, you know a relative number. Um, but if you usually jog on your easy days at uh, you know at an eight minute mile pace, um, you know then I might start start at at least you know um, you know nine nine minute mile pace. And then essentially every every minute you, you're going to be um, increasing the, the speed by a half mile per hour um, until you get to the point where you can't do um, another full minute. Okay, so you might be, uh, you know, increase it six or seven times. Um, you're just, you know, just increasing the speed. And when you get to a point when you can't, you know, you can't complete that last last minute, then just, just sort of cut it off. And, um, and then basically you take that last speed and the the incline, assuming you used two percent, and you plug that into into the equation, which um, you know I'll put on the screen here, and I'll and I'll put it in the description as well, and, and it gives a pretty good estimate of what your of what your VO two max is. Um, I think in general this one's going to be um, you know a little, little bit more more accurate than than the Cooper test, um, but it's not going to be as accurate for a, a seasoned or elite athlete as as doing the time trial. Um, you know I, I think. Simplicity and difficulty are, are two two very different things. I think the you know the, the treadmill incline test is probably a, you know a little bit more complicated, a little bit more complex to do it, um, but it is probably a little bit easier to do. Um, you know, just the fact that you, you're sort of gradually increasing your the the, the pace, uh, it, it sort of tends to make the the tests. Uh, you know, it, it, it usually it ends a little bit quicker, and it also doesn't require you to be good at pacing, right? All you're doing is basically not falling off off the treadmill, and you, um, you know, you're just basically increasing increasing the speed every every minute, and so there's no real reliance on you doing a good job of pacing this. You just eventually you're going to get to a point where you can't, um, you know, you can't run anymore, and so you stop. And like I said, you just take take the last um, you know the last numbers for your your speed and your uh, and your incline, and you plug those into your equation, and it's it's pretty much all taken care of there. So that's a pretty basic rundown of the different ways you can estimate your your VO two max. Um, you know, in in practice, a lot of um, 
you know, a lot of elite athletes and the seasoned athletes don't necessarily feel the need to to go through, through those protocols. They, they can get a pretty good sense of um, of where they're at just based on their 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 everyday training. Um, you know, especially if you're training for and racing in in shorter distances. Um, you know, mile, mile to ten k training presents you know plenty plenty of opportunities to to be running at VO two max type type paces. And, and you're, you're going to be running 5K races or, um, or something in that ballpark. And so you get plenty of opportunities to, to get a gauge on your, um, on your VO2 max. Um, you know, but, but even when I'm doing, doing marathon training, I, I, don't, um, I don't typically race too, too many 5Ks during, during those training bouts. Um, but, but I do do multiple VO2 max workouts, and I, and I tend to just have a sense of, um, of where I am based on how, how those workouts are going. Um, like a, a good sort of standard workout that I, that I will do most, most seasons would, would, would be a three by one mile workout. And, and for me, typically, uh, the three by one mile workout that, that pace does a pretty good job of predicting, um, you know, what, what my current, current five, five K, um, ability is. And, and typically, you know, I'll do two, two minutes rest and, and, and certainly that's easier than running running a 5k but um, typically when I'm doing that workout you know I'm not I'm not going to the well like I would in a um, you know in a, in a 5k race and and you know there's definitely um, you know I, I probably couldn't quite match that for a 5k pace but at least it gives me a good idea um, you know so for instance if I'm if I'm running it at if I can do that workout at five minute pace you know three by one mile at five minute pace, then, then I'm probably think I could probably run somewhere in the you know fifteen forty five um, range for for a five k, and you know I'll plug that in to to get an estimate of my VO two max, and um, and you know for me it's probably probably good enough. You know it doesn't um, it doesn't really need to be a hundred percent accurate. Um, you know a lot of the you know, a lot of the workouts I do, even though I will heavily reference the, you know, the, the pacing tables, a lot of it still just goes by feel. And if, um, you know, if I'm having, you know, two or three weeks in a row where everything just feels too easy or too, too difficult, then, then I make adjustments accordingly. And then you can just sort of see where you are. Um, but obviously that comes with, you know, comes from lots of experience and that's not something that I, that I think you're just going to be able to do intuitively. Um, you know, I've been, been doing, you know, workouts of that nature, um, since I was thir 13. So, um, you know, that's, that's 35 years now. And so there's, there's, there's a lot of workouts behind that, that experience. Um, certainly it doesn't take that, that much experience to, to do it. Um, and then things change as, as you get older, but, um, but I do have a pretty good feel for, for my body and to how to make those adjustments. And so, um, so anyways, I, I hope this was useful. I hope it, um, you know, depending, no matter where you are on the spectrum, I think it's a, it's a good idea to be able to, to estimate what your VO2 max is. Um, like I said, all, all, pretty much all the, the training tables, is, you know, tend to, to use that as the baseline. Um, you know, personally, I think for, you know, for some distances, like, you know, the marathon, for instance, you could argue that, you know, that your lactate threshold might be, might be more important. And, you know, and I can, and I can do a separate video on, on that. Um, but it's, it's good, it's good to know either way what, what your VO2 max is. And, and, and even if you do, if you are conscious of what your lactate threshold is, it's good to be able to sort of compare the two and to be able to, you know, assess your relative strength, whether it's for the, you know, the shorter races or the longer races, um, so yeah, thanks for thanks for watching and um appreciate appreciate the support on the, for the channel. All right, take care everyone.